All right, thank you for that introduction. Just to get started, I'll be discussing today learning in the wide open. Uh, how we as teachers and educators and organizations and institutions can make use of open spaces for learning effect. Uh, my name is Michael Gallagher. There's my contact information in case you want to get a hold of me, which will be repeated on the, uh, the final slide. Uh, just to reiterate some of the points mentioned in that introduction, uh, yes, I do have institutional affiliations with several of these with all of these uh, institutions listed here, but uh, I want to point out that the the main source of my collaboration these days is with uh, Pika, who is the man uh, shown there, who is affiliated with Hegia Helia, University of Applied Sciences in Finland. So most of the mobile learning work I'm doing now involves uh, pedagogies and learning approaches that he and I are sort of uh, working through as we speak. So much of what you'll see in this presentation is the result of our thinking and our collaboration workshops we perform. So just to jump right into it, uh, my research interests are M learning, obviously. I wouldn't be here otherwise. Uh, humanities, I'm much more uh, interested in, uh, I see the application of STEM subjects. I'm interested in the non-STEM fields, uh, the humanities, the literatures, the uh, literacies, the languages, history, cultural heritage, et cetera, et cetera. These places where fuzzy uh, dialogue-based processes are much more important. Uh, than perhaps the scientific method. So I'm interested in those spaces. I'm also interested in multimodality, which uh, basically refers to how we communicate and make meaning across any number of modes. Uh, and just uh, simplistically, you can think of multimodality as being a way to make meaning across uh, modes, not just text, which I should emphasize there too. My, my gut feeling is that mobile learning sort of uh, brings these things to the surface, these other forms of media and modes. And we need, as educators and, and learners and teachers and, and organizational people, we need to actually make use of that to encourage that literacy because that's a, that's a different way of expression. I'm also very interested in field activity. And field activity, what I mean is basically uh, reverting to an old, uh, traditional accepted disciplinary practice of going out into the field, collecting data, bringing it back and making sense of it later on. Uh, a basic scientific method that's used across the humanities and the sciences. So it's an interesting approach that sort of bridges these two fields. Uh, we have uh, historians doing this. They collect data, archaeologists, architects, etc., etc. And we have scientists doing the same thing, biologists, natural scientists, field scientists, etc. So I'm interested in field activity as an actual method. I'm also interested in informal formal learning and the bridging the divide between that. I think many people will disagree with me. I think much of that divide is constructed. I don't think the average learner will point to much difference between the two as they're moving between a particular uh, learning objective or learning activity. So they naturally oscillate between these informal and formal states of being. We need to acknowledge that. And I'm also interested, and I've worked um, quite a bit in uh, mobile for development as well. I don't currently work as much in that, but I still keep my ties with that community as well. So those are my research interests there. My questions, and I, I want to frame these questions for this presentation. My overriding questions are this. Basically, uh, what role does mobility and motion have in teaching and learning? And what are the positive principles of mobility itself? Uh, we need to start thinking about uh, constructing mobile learning as an entity unto itself. Okay, and I'll, I'll revert to this a little bit later on in the presentation, but what positive principles does mobility and motion present to us that we can make use of in our pedagogies and in our uh, teaching approaches? So does mobile learning support deep learning? What I'm thinking here is uh, fuzzy, dialogue-based, deep, uh, holistic learning approaches. So we, uh, we do emphasize often in the mobile learning literature that mobile learning is bite-sized, it's modular, it's discrete uh, pieces of material, content, activities, output. And I think that's perfectly acceptable for the limitations of the technology at times. But I think we ha we're mature enough as a model now that we can start to explore these broader, deep thinking approaches uh, to mobile learning. So that's one of my overriding questions. Another question there is, how are, do we have the capacity for thinking and speaking across media, 
modes, and spaces? And do we want to develop that capacity in our workers, our students, our learners, selves? Okay, when I say think and speak, uh, when I say speak, basically I'm referring to composing here. Do we want to develop further capacity for speaking, composing across a wide variety of modes, uh, forms of media, and in different spaces, both informal and formal, open and closed? So these are overriding questions I have. My observations from the research, uh, this is my PhD research and as well as my professional research, uh, my research as a professor, etc. These are my general observations, and it varies depending on uh, the group you're working with, but we often have an incomplete understanding how learning works in open spaces. And I'm defining open differently here, so I brought, I, I broached that uh, subclause there, or how to define open at all. Okay, uh, I define openly, and Pika and I do as well, we define openly quite differently. Uh, I believe more naturally, which is open as concept of inclusivity. And I'll show you in a few slides exactly how we define that. So the miniaturization of content and activities requires balance and contextualization. What I should point out, that's the second point, that we miniaturize a lot of things in uh, mobile learning. We take curricula and or learning or training programs, we break that down into modular units. Often we lose sight of the bigger picture and uh, when we do so. There's a lack of cohesion, this is just from my observation, there's a lack of cohesion in the broader approach. What are the ultimate objectives of this activity? And sometimes we lose sight of that. And that's important when you're dealing with, at least with formal, formal learning. And also too, uh, my observation is that we, a process-oriented approach or a process-oriented pedagogy, something that emphasizes process, avoids technological determinism. So a real pitfall in mobile learning is this sense of technological determinism, which I think a, a, a few of the different speakers in this event are much more qualified to speak about than I am. But uh, we want to avoid that by emphasizing not the technology, but the process. So we don't emphasize the outcome or the output, but we emphasize the process. If we emphasize the process, we avoid a lot of those pitfalls. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. So decisions, we have decisions points. I think as educators, teachers, learners, or people even involved in organizational learning in a, in a public or private non-government you know, government space, we have decisions to make. Are we emphasizing STEM or non-STEM? My general emphasis is non-STEM just because I, I work in that field and I feel it's underrepresented. So also fuzzy ideas or discrete outputs. Are, what are we emphasizing here? Uh, are we falling prey to the same thinking that emphasizes assessment, uh, summative assessments and discrete outputs, or are we acknowledging that fuzzy idea generation discussion creation phases of learning, the real generative stuff? Uh, are we emphasizing process over outcome? I mean, my emphasis is that process is much more important than outcome or output, uh, but what, are, what do you choose to represent? It depends on your organizational needs. And method or madness, and the reason I sort of emphasize the method or madness, methods are means to get to a point. There are means for framing an activity. They should never dictate the outcome entirely. Uh, so you always run a risk of, of being too strict or striding with your method, methodological approach. You want to avoid that. The methods you choose, I know they're not the same thing, but the methods you choose uh, are very important in determining the outcome. So you have to run the gamut between a nice, healthy balance between uh, madness, which I refer to as a, a non-method, as an open approach, and method, a method-oriented approach. So the methods you choose are critical in this whole process, so it's important to choose those wisely. Again, I'm trying to emphasize the following, that our current form formal curricula, organizationally as well as uh, educationally, I, I mean, I'm not just referring to schools and universities here, I'm referring to organizations, businesses, government uh, associations, et cetera, et cetera. We have a much stronger emphasis on outputs, assessments, literacies, et cetera. M actually, I shouldn't say literacies. It's much stronger emphasis on output. Uh, I think this place here, we need to have a much stronger emphasis on process. And I think mobile learning um, helps us get there because it emphasizes that this, that middle step where you have an open space and you have to manipulate it, have to make use of it for learning effect. 
So how do we do that? We start with open space. Now let's go back to the definition here. An open space is the broadest uh, idea we have. Now we have open across the curriculum here. We have open source, open access, we have open learning. Uh, any number of concepts of open, we're talking about systems here. Uh, the way Pika and I uh, work with open is that it's a broader, much, much broader idea. This We're saying open in the sense that it's outside, outside of formal curricula. And that's basically all we're referring to. So our definition of open is such uh, a state of inclusivity. I should put an of there, there's no of. But objects, artifacts, places, peoples, and events. Inclusive. Uh, and so there's a social element, there's a material element, there's a uh, geographical, a physical, a psychological, an emotional, an intellectual element to open. We have to acknowledge that all of those exist, and all of those are being uh, are coming together in an intersection that generates the context for learning. It's also a mental state that acknowledges that meaning is gleaned from an alignment with what is available. And let me talk about this alignment. And this is basically our theory about how learning works in open spaces, mobile learning works in open spaces. It begins with this. So you have learning in the open. We'll just run this through a, slow, a short little narrative here. We have ubiquity, which means we see everything, and so therefore we see nothing. Uh, so we're looking at this scene of a, Paris, a Parisian cafe. We're looking out. We see a beautiful street. We acknowledge all these different things, but it's ubiquitous, which means there's material and there's learning elements everywhere, so they're nowhere. So it begins with an, uh, a beginning perception. There's a perceptive element at the very beginning of the learning process where we acknowledge that there might be something in that landscape that we can make use of for learning effect. It might be a, a subconscious activity, and often it is, uh, but it's an important first step, is that alignment, the beginning of alignment. It's transformed. That space becomes transformed. Uh, we are aligning uh, the environment to make use of it for learning. This is a very critical first step, at least in our experience it has been. There's a presence, there's a social presence in the landscape, in the environment, in that open space. Uh, there's an emotional residue. So the emotion tells you, uh, and that could be whether it's beautiful or it's ugly or it creates an emotional effect, something along those lines, it forces you to take notice of the environment. So there's an emotional residue that is in, into the environment that forces us to make use of it. The intellect comes later. The intellect phase, it might come simultaneously, but it doesn't come first. The intellect allows us to make, to begin to process, to churn meaning from that environment. And then we're aligned. It's a tilt. An alignment is an aesthetic tilt, basically, where we transform the space into a learning space. So open and ubiquity becomes specific and learning. Okay, there's this whole process that goes on there, as we see it. So we believe in this learning in the open and mobile technology. Mobile learning is really where this is enacted, we believe. Uh, mobile learning needs to operationalize or make visible the stage of alignment. So our job, at, pedagogically, whether it be in education or private industry, our job is to make this visible to our, our learners, the state of alignment. Okay. If they're able to take an open space, if they're able to uh, make use of that open space systematically and incessantly, which means they're always doing it, okay? If they're able to make use of these open spaces, we're, we're, we are generating uh, a process-oriented approach to their learning. They're highly visible, highly aware of the learning processes, the machinations underneath, okay? You're generating the engine that produces meaning in them, that fire in them. Uh, we reduce emphasis on the output in favor of process. If we focus on alignment rather than output, we focus on uh, uh, out, we focus less on output and in more on the process. And more importantly, organizationally and for higher education, we're emphasizing critical and uh, you know we need to avoid. I mean, uh, the term artistic will sometimes turn people off, but that's basically what we're doing here. We're emphasizing critical artistic multimodal thinking. We're emphasizing creativity. Uh, we're emphasizing making use of spaces in ways they weren't made use of before, at least not consciously. So this is a, an amazing organizational advantage to have. So if you emphasize the process, you're generating the, you're generating the learners uh, in your organization as well. 
So the needs for this, we need to acknowledge as pedagogically or as teachers and learners, instructional designers, we need to acknowledge that complexity exists in the open. And that complexity is a powerful tool. Okay? There's a complex environment out there to make use of. We need to identify mutually the method and the process to make use of that open environment and that complexity. And we need to reflect early and often. The real key to this whole process is the reflection. If you embed reflection, and it doesn't have to be, now think about this. It doesn't have to be that. It can be compose this, record this, do this, reevaluate your process here. Uh, you have to reflect early and often to generate the results you want in this whole process. So uh, we have to identify methods for engaging with it. In our case, we chose field activity. We have to identify and socially negotiate the process. It's important for the learners to negotiate their own processes for performing this activity and to reflect on whether or not it's useful. Uh, in terms of the pedagogy itself, Pika and I have developed what we call the pedagogy of simultaneity. And I have a reference for that in the, in the references slide. Um, the pedagogy of simultaneity uh, has a lot of parts, but it's basically designed to make use of these open spaces in a systematic way. And it, it's bedrock, it's sort of the foundation on which it rests are these, are these ideas here. This trust, discussion, collage. So basically we believe trust, all pedagogy in this space, in this mobile learning space, has to revolve around trust. The trust, uh, your trust in the ability of your learners to make sense of their own learning. Your trust in your ability as a teacher to allow students to learn in ways that have meaning to them. Uh, discussion, uh, that there's a social element that's the basic core of most uh, modern pedagogy anyways, or learning theory is that uh, that social interaction is the key uh, to making meaning. Uh, collage, I mean you can call this anything you want. Uh, composition, collage, uh, aggregations, assemblies, I mean they have a million different uh, names, but we believe they all revolve around the same thing. This idea is that we're we're putting meaning together, you're seeing it together from the resources available to you. And then the alignment as well, which we discussed. So this was enacted through a series of workshops we've done, some formally, some informally. And uh, we believe the informal ones, where it's just a group, a small group of people, are just as important as the formal elements because uh, this pedagogy and mobile learning, in my opinion, doesn't shouldn't be overemphasizing the formal versus informal divide. It should be moving pretty seamlessly between those. So we had events. In Helsinki, uh, Seoul, Korea, where I'm based. Uh, Finland is where my colleague Pika is based. Uh, Tallinn in uh, Estonia. Informally, we've done this in Edinburgh, uh, London, New York. Anywhere we've been mutually, we've actually tried to do these types of events. And they involve a basic process. And that basic process is, and there's nothing original in the process. I should say that too. Novelty was not our goal. Uh, innovative, real novel approaches wasn't our goal. It was apt approaches, so choosing the right method and the right process for the job. That's all I cared about, and that's all I still care about. My heart is still in the pedagogy. It's not in the teaching and the impact of that teaching. It's not as much in uh, novel novelty. So learning in the open, the process here is you have an open informal workshop, and this can be a physical workshop. It could be an online workshop. It doesn't really matter. It's participant driven. Participants drive the ideas. So objectives are loosely defined. You come together and you have a loose, you develop a loose frame or objective to guide the activities. And then data is collected. You can just send your legions out into the streets, basically, which is exactly what we did in Helsinki. Uh, we sent legions uh, into the streets to record uh, based on their particular frame of reference, a loose frame. For example, history, or religion, or art, or signage, or any or socialization, any number of things you can choose to initially frame your conversation. So data is collected, any number of the data, uh, you could have coordinates, media, you know, image, video, audio, text, anything you want at all. Data is reflected upon. You bring the, the data together within groups you have mutual composition activities where they use the same data in any way they feel free. So it's all open. It's all very open uh, OER oriented. Uh, data composed. You compose compositions, and I'll show you a few of those in a second. Uh, and then the compositions or the meaning is scrutinized through dialogue and discussion. This is real emphasis here. So the process is, is 
uh, paramount here. And this process can actually vary depending on your organizational needs, but the basic process is, you know, is important. It's very, very important. So you have to spend a lot of time up front establishing this uh, to ensure that it works well. The process to continue that, the loosely negotiated a theme, uh, like I said, religion or history or sociology or whatever your approach is will be. Uh, we had some some people do uh, a whole focus on signage and the confu uh, signs in their city streets and what different messages they're trying to project, and that evolved into something else. Of course, you collect data, identify themes emerging from the data. That's important. Mutually, you start to identify the themes emerging from the data. And then you compose, present, and share. And everything becomes an OER. I mean, participants can opt in and out of this if they want. That's fine. But everything becomes uh, OER. It's open, which is then this OER is then recirculated back into, um, into the learning community again to make use of any way they see fit. So it's a cyclical, systematic process uh, where they learn, reflect, learn, reflect, compose, reflect, etc. Uh, and I should mention all these are, are, are taken from various uh, workshops we did. Some of the themes, some of the themes emerging from the workshops and from our own research are such that we as human beings are naturally multimodal, which means we naturally move between image, audios, text, speech, body language, etc. Any number of modes we're constantly and perpetually moving between. And we have to make that visible to the learners to begin their development in that space. Uh, transduction, which is that process of moving between modes. Uh, we believe transduction is this grinder of meaning. So you really begin to generate meaning when you're moving between these spaces. So when I move text into an image-based representation, or vice versa, or I present my media, uh, with my voice. Uh, this is basic, basically transduction. I'm moving between one mode to another. And in those moments, in that movement between these modes, we believe that the greatest learning is actually taking place. So, and we believe also that reasons, understanding, themes, knowledge, etc., even even logic for doing the activity will emerge through doing it. We believe that the only way to learn in these spaces is by doing the learning in these spaces. Uh, there's only so much theorizing you can do beforehand, we believe, to account for the, the ephemeral variables that you're going to experience along the way. Some of the outputs we have uh, include any number of things. They're all multimodal type things. Uh, videos, audios, embeds, uh, uh, audio map of the various sounds of the Helsinki subway, uh, representations. All of these are combinations of modes, uh, combinations of texts and media and images and video and uh, speech, any number of things. They all sort of embrace motion in the, in the general idea. So the basic outcomes of such an activity, uh, it really emphasizes, and if you're able to do this every so often, you're going to reiterate the importance of process. You're going to develop a design pr process orientation. This is basically design. Uh, develop a design process orientation in your learners or your workers or your teachers, whoever it might be, uh, you're going to develop this design process orientation. You're going to develop a very aggressive uh, form of active learning that students will be eager, enthusiastic, and uh, presumably enthusiastic to learn based on how visible the learning process is to them. If they see the process and this process as a machine to generate meaning, they're going to generate meaning because they'll embrace the machine. Uh, and they'll constantly be tinkering with the process as opposed to the output. Uh, develops critical thinking. Uh, this, this is the essence of critical thinking because it's making meaning and structure and form and process from nothing in open spaces. Um, by nothing, I mean everything. It's ubiquitous, right? So it's all out there. They have to construct their own ways to make meaning in those spaces. Uh, we believe it actually accelerates uh, lifelong learning. So if your interest is in lifelong learning and the role mobile learning, mobile technology can play in that, we believe it accelerates that process because it does create this, uh, this uh, it creates this process-oriented approach to learning, uh, so which they can apply to any number of things. There's no limit to the applications. It just emphasizes the process. So we believe it accelerates that. We believe it accelerates uh, multimodality and media composition. There's skills that people need to have. Uh, the ability to, to speak across images or to speak through video, to speak through audio, 
I haven't been in an organization where that wasn't important to some degree. So it continues. It continues. We generate that in our learners through an orientation to process. Organizationally, it has any number of, uh, of impacts. Uh, it broadens the scope and the impact of the organization because you have your, your workers, your, your members, your students, your teachers representing you outside of the, outside the formal formality, the formal boundaries of the organization. We believe it extends formal learning into the field. It gets it outside the classroom in a natural, cohesive way, in a logical way, because it emphasizes process. Uh, it generates aggressive, critical thinkers. Uh, it generates design-oriented learners. More importantly, I believe organizationally, it removes the straitjackets of assessments and curricula and formal outputs. Those are straitjackets to some degree. If you double down, you move away from the assessments for a moment and emphasize the process and have the assessments involve strictly reflections about the process. And I think you have, you've made quite a significant jump uh, into uh, loosening your, uh, your, your abilities out. I believe ultimately, organizationally, it's the ultimate skunk works as well. It's, uh, it's something that represents absolute change to the organization. Uh, and it presents a model for change to the organization that everybody can define for themselves. It's not limited one group. Uh, pedagogically, it, it removes the limits of formal curricula. It uh, extends the scope of learning. Uh, it releases the pressure on formal learning. We're in a little bit of a straitjacket with formal learning. Uh, so it allows them to focus on content, practice. It, uh, this kind of learning emphasizes application, context, and use of natural environments, very, very important. It, ex it emphasizes the use of natural environments, the open environments that exist out there. This is real life, real world application of learning. So my references here, in case you're interested, I, I did have a few of my own that represents a few of those activities we did in Helsinki uh, and elsewhere, as well as a paper that Pika and I wrote uh, regarding this. I have several other uh, resources here that have inspired us uh, through the course of this development including uh, my good friends at uh, University of Edinburgh there, that Manifesto for Teaching Online. Very important to emphasize that uh, in their case, they were talking about teaching online, that good learning uh, in online spaces is developed for online spaces. It's not ported over from other places. And I believe the same is true for mobile learning. The best mobile learning is born mobile. It's developed from the mobile space. It's not ported over from another space, so that's important. And I include another colleague there from the University of Edinburgh as well, Jeremy Knox, who, who sort of broadens the definition and critiques the definition of the open educational resources movement, the OER movement. And we're sort of, uh, uh, sort of jumping on that bandwagon as well by trying to broaden how we define mobile altogether. So many thanks for having on the last slide here, you'll see my contact information. I welcome anybody who wants to participate and join in. Uh, we'll be happy to discuss with you. And otherwise, thank you very much for having me. I look forward to the next uh, opportunity to speak to you all. Bye.